here what is the definition of the PAH pulmonary arterial hypertension we all understand about definition uh, really isn't it so what happens is because it includes vasoconstriction obstructive remodeling of the pulmonary vessel wall inflammation and also the in situ thrombosis why we are able to understand this because this is the one which tends to cause its complication complications leading to RV overload or even the right ventricular failure and premature death. So when we try to look closely at the pulmonary arteries, these are the remodeling changes which tends to happen. And the understanding is even more important because the therapy is also going to depend upon that. So for example, you can classify on the, for example, for the, uh, whenever you are trying to classify the pulmonary hypertension patients into sub two subgroups you can divide. So one is the one which is where the pulmonary vascular resistance is more than three woods unit and where the PA wedging pressure will be less than 15 millimeters of mercury. While there is a, another group in which the etiology is mostly due to the left-sided heart diseases in which the wedging pressure is more than 15 millimeters of mercury and is associated with LV not only systolic dysfunction, diastolic dysfunction and also the valvular disease in fact. Similarly, there, there can also be associated lung diseases. Lung diseases, how you classify them? So when you do the wedging pressure is less than 15 millimeters of mercury and is associated with most of the common diseases are COPD, interstitial lung diseases, sleep disorder breathing, or even high altitude exposure as well. Similarly, the other causes are also there, like in which there may be multifactorial reasons like the splenectomy, vasculitis, sarcoidosis, or CRF as well, or sometimes even secondary to the thrombolic, thromboembolic remodeling, in fact. So coming to the classification, they are divided into four groups. The first group is the one which is also called as idiopathic familial or the ones which are associated with the connective tissue disease, portal hypertension, HIV infection, drugs and toxins, and also other diseases as the hemoglobinopathies, myeloproliferative diseases, and splenectomy as well. Similarly, what about those other venous or capillary invo involvement, those diseases like the pulmonary veno-occlusive diseases or even the hemangiomatosis? Okay, so what are the other causes you all are aware of? Just a second. I will mute you guys for two minutes. You can think. Hello. So, uh, do you all, I hope everyone Hello? Can everyone hear me? Hello, Dr. Narendra. Can you hear me? Yes, doctor. Students are able to hear the faculty. Kindly respond to the faculty. Okay, perfect. So now coming to the other causes. So what are the other causes which can cause? So, as I was telling you that there are a lot of connective tissue disorder as well, which we all have to rule out. So, if the, yes, wonderful. So, there will be patients who may be having, especially like systemic sclerosis. So, if a patient, patient's pH is associated with systemic sclerosis, particularly poor prognosis is really associated with them. Similarly, if someone is having a congenital heart disease, so we all are very much aware whenever those congenital heart diseases patients tend to grow up, they are the ones, for example, up to 15% of them will be developing PAH. So it's a very big number, in fact. And what is the reason is, of course, uh, the most common type which is encountered in them is the Eisenminger syndrome. So, the, so what will happen is the blood starts flowing due to the pressure differences. Uh, okay, and what about, so what is happening is also the newer infections like the HIV. So HIV is also suited with the pH, although it's rare, 
the incidence is not so common, but it may happen in fact as well. And uh, although it has also been shown that it is irrelevant to the immunosuppression in fact. And sickle cell disease as well, which we all are aware, it's a genetic disorder of the hemoglobin. So that also can cause, and in fact, the incidence is up to almost 50%. So sickle cell disease patient, if you come across, you have to be aware that, yes, this is the patient which may be having this disease. So when whenever a patient comes to you with the clinical problems, the signs or the symptoms, you can classify it into four classes. Those four classes are similar to the NYHA classification, in fact. So in the sense, so class one is the one which doesn't cause any significant limitation of the physical activity. Class two is the one in which slight limitation is there. And only when ordinary activity will be causing the dyspnea, fatigue, chest pain, or even near syncope as well. Then comes the class three. Class 3 is the one in which it causes marked limitation. So, for example, they may be comfortable at rest, but a little bit also they will try to do activity, they get problems. And then about the class 4, even at rest, they are symptomatic. Now coming to the incidence. So, incidence is a rare disease. It's a rare disease, yes. But uh, with a prevalence of almost, I would say, like 40 to 50 cases in a million. So, it's not too much, but yes. It is. It can, you may be able to observe them. But the thing is, most of the times they are misdiagnosed, not inappropriately diagnosed as well. Especially with, uh, if you come across a HIV patient, sickle cell disease, systemic sclerosis, then you have to be really careful to look out for all these kind of diseases as well. So, um, coming to the sexual disposition, it's more commonly seen in the young women especially around the age of group of 36 years in fact okay so similarly the one of the reason remains is why why does it even develop actually so as we already said it it involves multiple factors it's a pretty complex disease with the uh, involvement of biochemical pathways and a lot of different cell types as well that is the reason uh, due to the involved vasoconstrictors, vasodilators, as nitric oxide, prostacycline, and also thromboxin A2 and endothelin 1, they are the ones which is involved. They have been trying, they have been developed, trying to use, trying to decrease the etiological factors which tend to cause the pH. So, for example, endothelin. Endothelin, what happens is they tend to take care of the to helping to fight the fibrosis, the hypertrophy, the inflammation, or even the vasoconstriction. And prostacycline, I think you all are already aware, this is a very potent vasodilator. Nitric oxide as well, it is one of the EDRF. So what is EDRF? Endothelial-derived relax, relaxing factor. So we all are very much aware about the symptoms. So the patient is going to come with complaints of breathlessness, fatigue, dizziness, syncope, peripheral edema, chest pain, and especially which tends to increase on exertion. Earlier you are able to diagnose, better is the quality of life which you may be able to give to your patient, in fact. So, but yes, uh, because the, like the disease itself, the diagnosis is also complex. So, the diagnosis can be delayed up to several years, in fact, and that is the reason uh, you have to be careful about this WHO classification. So how do you diagnose? Initially, of course, is whenever those uh, patient comes to you, you have to suspect the clinical disease, or as I said, those uh, associated disease syndrome, which are associated with higher frequency of the disease as well, isn't it? So similarly, you have to try to identify the other causes of the pulmonary hypertension as well. Okay, and then you have to evaluate and also classify the disease, especially for its type, functional capacity, and also the hemodynamics. So how do you do the screening in pH? So what are the keys to early diagnosis? As I said, it, the patients with the systemic sclerosis, HIV, 
or with a familial disease or familial history or also if there's you come across a patient with poor to pulmonary hypertension so then you have to uh, be a little bit more eager to suspect the disease and I had already said it so what happens is Doppler echo is a big boon in the sense it's it really helps you to easily screen those high risk of patients so what happens is you can definitely tend to limit the functional capacity of the patient if you are able to screen those patients regularly so annual screening of the patients is very much important so this is how you use the echocardiography as you can see the systemic pulmonary artery pressure is equal to the RV systolic pressure and RV systolic pressure is four times the velocity square plus the right atrial pressure isn't it so it's a wonderful screen tool and which is easily found so what are the other things how will you diagnose so you can do is when you are uh, in the right heart doing the catheterization when you are trying to go through the different segments this is the characteristic waveform which you see when you are there in the developed different uh, segments of the heart so okay so that's why it is called is you try to do what is called as the right heart catheterization which is considered the gold standard okay for this so you try to see the wedge pressure so for example what happens is so on the basis of that you can even do the definition definition of the pH so what is as I said it so what happens is it will be a patient is going to be classified as a pH when they sustain elevation of the mean pulmonary arterial pressure more than 25 millimeters at rest and 30 millimeters at exercise with a mean pulmonary wedge pressure or LV in diastolic pressure less than 15 millimeters of mercury and of course the pulmonary vascular resistance more than three woods unit and a positive vessel reactive response is defined as a reduction in mean pulmonary arterial pressure which is more than 10 millimeters of mercury you know to reach a absolute value of mean pulmonary artery pressure of less than 40 with increase or unchanged cardiac output so Nani Tej, can you mute your microphone please? Nani Tej, can you mute your microphone? Yes, good. So as I was telling you, uh, now it's karim.com. Okay, good. So don't forget these values. These values are very important. In the sense, as I said it, pH, how do you define it as? When more than 25 millimeters of mercury at rest or more than 30 millimeter of mercury at, while exercising. Similarly, with a mean pulmonary wedge pressure or L left ventricular in diastolic pressure of less than 15 millimeter mercury. Okay and the pulmonary vascular resistance of more than three woods unit right similarly as, as i said it so you you will also be getting a positive vessel reactive response in such kind of patients and so for example what is defined as the mean pulmonary artery pressure of more than 10 millimeters of mercury okay and it will reach an absolute value of less than 40 millimeters of mercury either with increased or unchanged cardiac output. So it's really important. As I said, it, so this is the response. But also you have to be careful that a positive response is seen only in 10 to 15% of the patients, okay? And sustained response is even more difficult to say. So yes, it is important, but not always seen, positive response, okay? So the mean arterial pressure is the main thing, in fact, more than 25 at rest or 30 while exercising and a positive response with pulmonary vascular resistance of three woods unit or the LV in diastolic pressure less than 15 millimeter mercury so what are the other tests you are aware of I think you are very much aware of the six minutes walk test right so in the what are the 
some of the things which uh, are important is you should try to make sure there is a 30 meter corridor which is available and you mark it at regularly at three meter intervals and the patient should rest at least 10 meter minutes prior to the test and should not have performed any rigorous exercise at all in the last two hours in fact and then you you have to ask the patient to rate his baseline dyspnea as well and then after going to the after walking for the maximum capacity but not to run or jog they ask them to rest as necessary and yes you have to keep on counting each lap as the patient finishes it and of course as as i said it at the beginning and similarly at the end of the, you know, the test as well you have to ask the patient to rate the dyspnea okay so these are the values as i said it about the ph definition the mean pulmonary artery pressure more than 25 at rest more than 30 with exercise and wedging pressure less than 15 and pvr peripheral vascular resistance is more than three woods parth shah mute your microphone okay now coming to the treatment okay so now we are all we are trying to understand what it is what are the things which is happening so now coming to the treatment as i said it uh, so we already understood the pathophysiology the etiology in detail so the same thing those are the things which you have to also try to target okay to whenever you are trying to target the patient so for example thrombotic state is there so that is the reason you have to try to give anticoagulants similarly uh, there is vasoconstriction so for the vasoconstriction what you can do is you may try to use a calcium channel blocker therapy but remember that only 10 less than 10 percent of the, those patients also okay there's a message from okay yes yes that's why I'm, i've been trying to summarize as well so as i was talking about the pathophysiology so for example yeah the vasodilators so similarly because those patients can also have diuretics Good morning, sir. Uh, so for example those patients can also have developed the right heart failure as well so that is the reason you have to also try to use the diuretics for such kind of patients similarly those patients because the oxygen saturation tends to be very low for such patients so you also have to give them oxygen as well and it is up to 90 percent of the times so if you really want to risk stratify these patients so you can classify them into low intermediate and high risk low one is the one with less than five percent intermediate with five per to ten percent and high is the one with more than 10 percent of estimated one year mortality why is this mortality figure is very important is because on the basis of that only you can risk stratify with those patients and for those things what are the things you have to consider is syncope history who functional class the walking test the anti pro bnp the imaging you can do as well and also the hemodynamics so what are the treatments which has been specifically studied in the ph okay so phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors so which you can usually uh, use it orally itself though so they tend to uh, not only relax but also do have anti-proliferative effect on the vascular smooth muscle cells by reducing the reduction in levels of cyclic gmp similarly prostacycline analogs which may be delivered by continuous intravenous or subcutaneous infusion via the intermittent nebulizer and also the endothelin receptor antagonists so what happens is as i was talking about the mechanism they are the ones which will be blocking the eta receptor or eta b as well so yes and in spite of uh, trying to use all these medications still if the patient is having problems yes you may have to do balloon atrial septostomy or also heart and lung transplantation but even in the whole world as well there are very few centers who are doing such kind of uh, 
huge invasive procedures. So now this uh, table flowchart tends to summarize the treatment algorithm. Okay, so as you can already set it, so if it is a naive patient, so you have to first of all confirm the diagnosis using an acute vasoreactive test. If it is vasoreactive, you use a calcium channel blocker. If it is non-reactive, you will see the functional class. So if there is, if, <clears throat> so for the initial, yeah, you can always use initially is the monotherapy and you will try to see the response. If it is not working good, then you can try for the combination therapy, okay? Similarly, if there is a patient who is with uh, WHO functional class four, or someone with high risk, so you can always give them intravenous PCAs as well, okay? And then you will try to see for the response. Otherwise, if you come across directly a patient who has already been treated outside, so you directly take them to the double or triple combination therapy. And then, yeah, even after all these things, if someone is not able to do anything, then yes, you have to consider for lung transplant. So one of the common questions comes to our always mind is what about the therapies and how are they doing it? So I think you all would have already heard about some of these newer molecules as well. Something is called as mesitentin. Mesitentin, then selexipag as well is there. Otherwise, we all have already been using ambrisentin and tadanafil or versus ambrisentin as well on a monotherapy. Otherwise, same way tadalafil monotherapy versus ambrisentin and tadalafil uh, combination therapy as well. So one of the important parameters which we all always try to see for is how about the number of events which is happening. For example, so we'll try to go in detail. So what are we seeing in this? So when they try to co compare mesitentin monotherapy versus its combination with the phosphodiesterase type 5 inhibitors or prostacycline analogs, you can definitely notice, see, so with mesitentin 10 milligram alone, the patients without an event were one of the highest. And of course, the placebo was the lowest. So even in this, what we can notice is 10 milligram of mesitentin should be preferred compared to the 3 milligram. Okay, this is the same uh, graph, a little bit zoomed out. So 10 mg is, is much better. Similarly, when they try to compare the selexi pag as a monotherapy or in combination with the phosphodiesterase type 5 inhibitors, okay, so what had happened is selexi pag had a much more favorable outcomes in fact. So when we try to have a closer look, Similarly, although for uh, ambrisentin monotherapy, its combination therapy was much better. Okay, similarly, same thing applies for the ambrisentin and tadalafil combination therapy as well. So this is a, a very beautiful, great uh, slide actually, which I came across. So in one slide, whole of pH is described. So it's a, we'll try to go slide, uh, stage by stage, actually. So what do you come across in this slide? So what do you see? So these are the main, so in few minutes, we'll also try to summarize what, what are the, whatever we have learned so far. So coming to the causes, first of all, for the pH, we know, so it could be, idiopathic connective tissue disorder, COPD, congenital heart disease, hemolytic anemia, HIV, chronic heart failure, or cirrhotic portal hypertension, or even iatrogenic as well. Then, so, uh, do you all remember what were the other causes as well for this? Just try to use a chat box to write. Yeah, Boban? Uh huh. Uh -huh. EEG, uh, get it done. Ha ha ha, EEG, Aji Kardinge. Abhi Kardinge, or Shantak Mendeshar Kardinge. 
ठीक है सो नो वन यूज द चैट बॉक्स आई थिंक यू ऑल आर ऑलरेडी फॉरगेटिंग सो सो एज आई वॉज टेलिंग यू सो यू कैन ऑल्सो क्लासीफाई ऑन द बेसिस ऑफ द प्रोग्नोसिस द माइल्ड इंटरमीडिएट रिस्क और हाई रिस्क ऑफ द पी एच पेशेंट्स ओके हाउ मच कैन बी द मोर्टैलिटी सिमिलरली सो ऑन द बेसिस ऑफ द सिम्टम्स यू कैन ऑल्सो गिव प्रोग्नोसिस टू दोज पेशेंट्स so is it better prognosis or is it worse prognosis so if a patient is associated with rv failure rapid progression a syncope if in the 6 meter walk test less than 300 meters peak o2 uh you know less than 12 similarly there is rising bnp as well then if it is associated with tapse less than 1.5 or pericardial effusion it is associated with worse prognosis okay so yes how will you say that better prognosis so you can go through this wonderful table as well if the pa- that patient comes to you you can auscultate loud p2 rv s3 s4 may also be there or even the tricuspid regurgitation murmur may also be present so this is what we discussed then about the treatment about the treatment how do you see for example so this is how the normal lung will look like but this is how the ph will look like due to the pulmonary arterial hypertension there is hardly and due to the fibrosis and the vasoconstriction of the peripheries there is hardly any perfusion which is happening into the periphery so that is why this is the one which is called as ph so in the ph as i had said you initially try to see for the acute vaso reactivity testing you do so if it is positive yes then you can use oral calcium channel blockers and yeah if you get a good outcome yes continue ccbs if it is negative so then you have to risk stratify them is it low risk is it high risk if it is a low risk you have to you can give them monotherapies okay and if they start worsening with time then yes you may consider combo therapy similarly if it is already a high risk patient so you must always give them the combination therapies combination therapies or otherwise with epoprostenol or tripoprostyl or ilprost as well and as i already showed you some of the newer medications as well in spite of all these things if they are not able to improve you may do the atrial septostomy or even lung transplant as well so this is the same thing a little bit zoomed out for you all and the mechanism wise as i had already said it the mechanism is going through three paths nitric oxide pathway prostacycline pathway and also the endothelium pathway and this is the reason you follow these parts even for the treatment as well so do you all have any questions so far if if there are any questions uh, you can just uh, write me in the chat box any questions ha dipika yeah dipika ha dipika what happened ha 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 main 5 minute na aata hu 5 minute ye mera lecture khatam ho jayega ha so are there any further questions now if there are no further questions we will stop the session today here itself okay
Are there any questions? If there are If there are no further questions, we'll stop the session here itself. And you all are always welcome to uh, write.